You are listening to From Sobriety to Recovery with Jesse Mogul. Let's get to the show. Welcome back to From Sobriety to Recovery. I am your host, Jesse Mogul, and I am in addiction recovery. How are you all doing out there? Wow, has it been a week. So I hope that you all enjoyed the amazing conversation I had with Linda Shively. Um, I know from the people in the tribe, um, they have definitely gone on and taken her dragon quiz and been able to uh, figure out where they fall in there. It's been really cool listening to everybody talk about that. Uh, I hope that you took advantage of what Linda uh, presented for you all. It was a, it's really a cool way to just figure out where, uh, what, you know, where are your joys being stolen by the dragons and when can you begin to focus and harness that? And it's just a joy to be able to bring people onto this show who are doing amazing things in the field of mental health, regardless of whether it's, you know, specifically geared towards addiction um, or all of the other ways that mental health can show up in our lives. And I think it's important to note that getting sober doesn't immediately mean that everything in life immediately gets better. (laughs) That would be, that would be awesome and preposterous. (laughs) So... (laughs) There's so many things that go into play when it comes to our mental health and what exactly will allow us to grow and move forward and be, you know, mentally healthy. Because we're humans. And regardless of how much we would like to strive for perfection, you know, for those of you who are longtime listeners, you know that perfection isn't possible. Perfection doesn't even exist that that is subjective to your perspective, and that we're looking for progress. We're looking for progression, not perfection. And today's episode is going to be a bit of a hodgepodge, because, and I'll explain why. I, let's just slow it down for a minute, because <laughs> you know how I am when I get on the microphone with y'all. I get super pumped. Uh, I spent last week in Los Angeles um, at a training conference that uh, me and my co-trainer from episode 172, Aubrey Pohl, you met her then when we introduced you to NLP and offered you guys all that opportunity to learn neuro-linguistic programming, whether it's for your own mental health or perhaps you want to go off and help other people. You know, the community that has given you so much, perhaps you want to go off and you want to be able to give back. And so we train people on how to be life coaches and business coaches and recovery coaches and pretty much anything that is within the mental health field around helping people, what we teach is absolutely humongously beneficial. If you have gotten to this stage in the show and you are still excited every single time I put out an episode, it's because you enjoy hearing about neuro-linguistic programming. I just don't always say, hey, here's some neuro-linguistic programming. But the way that I am very thoughtful and aware of the words that I use comes from the teachings that I was taught that I now teach. You know, it was really interesting for Aubrey and I to realize that we had gone through our master's level education of neuro-linguistic programming five years ago to the day that we were now teaching master practitioner level neuro-linguistic programming. And in fact, the man who taught us the master's level came in and did a bonus section for everybody who attended this seminar we put on. And it was just really awesome to experience him getting to watch her and I teach this material that five years ago he introduced to it. And he's like, you know, where you take this is the sky's the limit. Who knows where this goes for you? And um, not everybody who took that master's level went on and and continued to do things with it. Some, they chose a different path. They chose whatever path worked for them. For Aubrey and I, we very much got into it all the way. So much so we became trainers. We had to go through (laughs) another 150 some hours to get certified with that. And now we train people on this and, you know, now I coach with it and I do the podcast around it. And I'm telling you all of this because when you train people for 40 hours in four days, (laughs) Your brain turns to mush. And um, I definitely felt that on day two, which would have been Friday, after I got done teaching ways to use language to help scramble someone's mind so that you can 
uh, bypass the conscious mind and get into the unconscious mind, which is where a lot of our trauma and our, and our, our healing needs to occur. It's in the unconscious mind. When I ask someone who's just very consciously aware in a, in a coaching session, you know, well, what's really wrong? They're going to be answering based off of their perception of their own reality, their very limited scope of what they've experienced going on around them. You know, every single second of your life, somewhere around 2.3 million bits of data are flying into your awareness from the texture of your wall to whether your pinky toe hurts or not, all the way to whether you can feel your right earlobe right now. All of this is being fed into your conscious, into your awareness. Now, the conscious mind handles 0.0006% of all the information that is flooded into your sensory awareness every single second. You can Google this stuff. This isn't like I'm just making this shit up. This is, there's a lot of different ways people will do these numbers. Jack Canfield says you get 11 million bits every second. A study at Harvard said it was 40 million bits every single second. That's really not as important as realizing that no matter what number somebody says, 40 million, 11 million, 2.3 million, when done with the math on how much you can consciously be aware of, almost, again, I'm not going to generalize, but almost across the board, everyone who studied this and has done some kind of research on it comes back with the same six ten thousandths of a percent that you can actually be consciously aware of. Right, that's zero 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 six. Right, it's six ten thousandths of a percent. Right, you got the you got six tenths, six hundredths, six thousandths, zero three zeros and a six is six ten thousandths. Um, that's not a lot. That's not a lot. And so when I go to ask a client or go to teach this, and people are like, "Oh, I've, I've got to be more aware than that," just realize that your mind doesn't have that capability consciously this uh, well, we're all we're all unique in who we are the way that the brain works is very figured out after tens of thousands of years of evolution we can see the patterns we can see the habits that people follow into I'm getting a little deep here because honestly, my brain's still a little bit mush. I'm not really sure I'm going to make a ton of awesome points in this episode. I just knew that it was Tuesday and I wanted to get on and express to you all how amazing this last week was teaching people about their conscious awareness and how much of it is not conscious. So when you go to help somebody heal, ultimately, if the conscious mind's the one answering all of the questions, then the unconscious mind where again, all the rest of that information is stored. That's where the real healing's at. And so one of the things that we teach is how to use words to scramble the brain up a little bit so that the conscious mind's like, I I don't know how to answer that question and just throws its hands up and the unconscious mind steps in and says, what was the question again? Okay, yeah, I can help you with that. Because the unconscious mind is the, the warehouse for every single thing you've ever experienced all the way from like what you were wearing on, you know, February 28th of 2011. That information is stored in there. You just don't need it. Like imagine how mind boggling that would be if you could remember all of that information. And there is, there is a scientific word for that. And I'm not going to turn the microphone off and try to find it. I'm not in the mood to do that today. But I do remember there was a actress um, who was on Ellen DeGeneres one time, and she went in there, and she's like, she can remember all of her days like they just happened. And she could, they could name off a date, and she could tell you what she had for lunch. Where that sucks is that that means that you could go back to the pain you felt the day somebody important died and literally relive it as if it just happened. That would be tough to not be able to push some of that stuff off to the unconscious mind and say, I don't need that kind of pain, that kind of trauma to be so readily available. There's a reason why the subconscious and the unconscious mind work the way they do. Because we don't want to have all of that stuff just sitting out on our desk constantly available to us. One, to me, it would just clutter up my brain. But two, it's, it's almost like we would the past would be so readily available, where would there be time for the present, right? So if the conscious mind is the room you are currently in, the subconscious mind's the closet, the unconscious mind's the attic. 
I'm okay with if you say, what was the name of your first, you know, your favorite dog as a kid? And I could say Rover. That's in the subconscious mind. It's readily available. When I need it, it's there. But it's not just laying out on the desk, just taking up space. I don't need to remember Rover's name all the time. Now, if you were to ask me to rattle off all of my dog's names, I'd probably have to get myself into a bit of a state of trance to be able to pull every single one of them out. That's where the unconscious mind comes in. It stores that information. And it's one of the reasons why when you get around people you haven't been around with for a while and they start to tell stories and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, 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 I I remember that now because that information was up in the attic. For them, maybe it was much more readily available. Maybe they kept it in their subconscious mind. All right, and now they pull it out, and you're like, oh, okay, just give me a second. Let me pull that out. Okay, now. And again, even in the memory, the, that memory, and, and in the remembering, the likelihood that you will get all of the details correctly, the way that somebody else experienced it, is 0% chance. Because your own subjective perspective of your reality, 126 bits again, right, very small, six ten thousandth of a percent to what was actually going on. Now, what the hell does any of this have to do with your sobriety and recovery? Because you're not remembering your past completely the way that it happened. Right? Figuring out whether you're being successful in your sobriety and recovery and trying to determine if you've been able to heal everything is a fool's errand. There's going to be so much that is locked away in your unconscious mind. It's the likelihood that you're going to get to every little thing and find all your little triggers in that first month or year or 10 years, it's, you're asking your human brain to do something that it just simply wasn't programmed for. Your, the patience is in the step-by-step. Occasionally, I'll catch myself saying I should be further along right now in my healing of my trauma and everything else. You know, Six years, I should be further along, but further along compared to whom? Further on compared to what? There's tens and tens of years. I mean, there's since I was popped out of the womb, that's 46 years of all these different things that I was making meaning of that could have been causing some level of strife or sadness or depression or trauma. To expect that they're all just going to be wiped away and clean is ridiculous. And each day is happening, so there's other things triggering and there's other you know, traumatic moments happening. And we've talked about trauma before. A moment, an event by itself can be traumatic. It turns into trauma the more we relive it in our minds over and over and over again, the more we attach it to other events that have occurred in our lives, the more that we just continue to screw it into our head is the more that a traumatic moment becomes trauma. Someone else could, you know, be swimming in a swimming pool and all of a sudden they get super frantic and they're, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I'm drowning, I'm drowning. And then, you know, they get saved, they end up at the side of the pool and they're like, whew, okay, well that was cool. And now they've learned to not swim that far out unless they've got enough energy. Another person does that, freaks out, still ends up at the side, still somehow ends up saved, but they relive it in their head over and over and over again. I'm a weak swimmer. I'm not strong. They start to use that as an identity statement. I'm not strong. I'm not strong. And now they don't ever want to swim again. And now they don't want to take on other challenges in their lives because one time they couldn't swim very well when they were seven years old and they turned that into a determiner of their strength for the rest of their lives. Versus somebody else who just had a moment, figured, you know what, the next time, let's just do it a different way and let's try it again. They continued to jump in the pool and then they became an amazing swimmer. If you're a parent out there, you will want to be very keenly aware of some of these moments that are happening that are just simply, it's just a little bit of, it's just traumatic. It's traumatic in the moment, but it doesn't have to become trauma if you have conversations around it. You show the kid like, okay, yeah, so today's swimming lesson didn't go all that well. But you know what? We're going to get back in the pool. We're going to try again. That's a growth mindset. Allowing one thing and be like, oh, my God, my little kid almost drowned in the pool. That's it. You're never getting in a pool. You are teaching that child a fixed mindset approach to life. You're saying, yes, if something doesn't go great the first time or even the 10th time, fuck the 11th time. And that's not going to benefit anyone. And I guarantee in your own life, you can go back and you can figure out somewhere that you were not pushed to step over a fear. And then that becomes an identity level statement. 
And when I teach people in LP and we go through these quantum scrambles and we go through these ways of reintegrating the trauma back into the healthy version of ourselves, like this is why it's so powerful because your mind is creating pictures of your life and what you have lived every single day. Your thoughts come with feelings. Those thoughts and feelings, they create pictures in your mind. The more you go back to a negative or an undesirable emotion, feeling, or event, the more that that gets continuously gets screwed into your head. With NLP, we teach you that you are so... You, you, you understand so little of what was being fed to your mind at that time that to think that you pulled out the, just the perfect 126 bits of information in that moment of despair in your childhood is ridiculous. So what if we just go back to that moment, to go back to that memory, but actually experiencing the memory? really experiencing it through our own eyes and then looking around that room, looking around that situation and saying, what else was I not aware of that was happening? Because oftentimes what I see as my parents not loving me and not being there to support me was just them being in a state of their own duress and they just didn't have the ability to put their duress to the side and focus on my duress. Doesn't mean that they were bad parents. It just means they were human. They weren't going to be perfect. So taking that side eye or taking that argument or taking that forgetfulness around picking me up from school doesn't mean that they don't love me. It just means in that moment, something else was going on in their life. But if I don't go back to that event in a healthy way, I just keep going back to it, looking to further screw that trauma into my brain, then I that's all I get from it is this, the trauma relived over and over and over and over again. One traumatic moment becomes lifelong trauma because as children were not taught how to make different meanings, right? We're not taught by people who actually know what the hell they're doing, how to understand what's going on in our mind. They'd rather teach, you know, algebra in the sixth grade than actually teach children how to understand their emotions, how to, how to use rational thinking thought and all of that jazz, We'd much rather just make sure everybody can get a really good grade on the standardized tests than actually growing humans that have an ability to use their rational thought and not always be so into their emotions that they can't really experience that event for just the singular event that it was. We're not encouraging people not to feel emotions. We want to feel the emotions. It's the reliving of the undesirable ones. That's where we start to find ourselves taking a traumatic moment and turning it into long-term trauma. All right, healing is the deep work. All right, we won't always think of something that needs to be healed until we feel the charge inside of us. Of completely eliminating every single trigger, every single activation point, every single moment that could possibly elicit a negative memory, a negative thought, an undesirable feeling. Right? That, that is the scope of that. Is, it'd be like trying to jump in the ocean and pull out just the right plankton. We won't often know that something is going to activate us, trigger us, send us into a surge until we feel something in our body. And so why we say on the show, when you feel a charge, take charge. Because the healing you will ultimately need to do for the rest of your life isn't all just laid out on the table. It's stored away in the sub and the unconscious mind. It's in the closet. It's in the attic. And it's there for a reason. It's there to benefit us. Because if everything was laying out on the desk all the time, how would we ever be able to experience the joy and the liveliness that comes from being in the moment, being present in ourselves right here and right now? If we're constantly reliving our past, where is there space to dream of a future? Healing is deep work. If I just said right now, you know, think of something, you know, think of Think of a limiting belief that you're holding on to that you want to let go of so that you can live your best life. Your your brain might just come to a screeching halt and be like, I have no idea. There's, I have no idea. It's almost too broad of a question, Jesse. Limit it down. Do I have a limiting belief about myself, my relationships, my career, my physical body, my emotional health, my mental acuity, my spiritual awakeness? Well, I need some fucking direction here, right? We often ask ourselves these questions using too broad of a paintbrush to try to just sweep it over everything. It's like, it's too much. Again, for the human brain, we want to give it direction. We want to give it some level of focus. 
What do we want to be healing today? And if something doesn't seem readily available, that's okay. Because your body will give you a signal at some point in time during the day. You will feel a charge. Maybe it's your the hairs on your arms standing up. Maybe it's the tickle on the back of the neck. Maybe your ears get warm. Your cheeks get flushed red. Right? All of a sudden, you go from really hot to really cold or really cold to really hot. Right? You see something on TV, and all of a sudden, it takes you back to a horrible memory or just a memory in general, and then that creates some sort of kinesthetic reaction in your body where now you're feeling something. And you're like, wow, why, why did out of nowhere this memory with this feeling att- attached just show up? That's the beauty of the human brain. It can make connections everywhere. It, we are meaning-making machines. It's what helped us survive as children when we barely understood thought, let alone feelings. I right? didn't understand none of that shit when we were three years old. Right? We understood body language, tonality, facial expressions. We understood that. We absolutely understand that. Right? We, can, we know what a mean face looks versus a happy face. We know what laughter sounds like over screaming. But we don't know how to make any meaning around it. So at the very formidable years of your life, your brain was making meanings of things that may not have been actually what was even happening. You're capable of far more than you realize. You always have been. Alcohol and drugs, you know, what was once the medicine became the poison, we get ourselves convinced that we need something externally to bring us joy, to bring us happiness, to bring us a, a level of contentment. But all of that is what's inside of us. So I haven't gone back to listen to the, to the Linda episode in a while, but I, I know from what I took from it, like, happiness comes from an external um, event. Happiness comes externally. Joy is internal. Joy is what you choose to feel. Like I said in, in one of the recent episodes, I don't seek to surround myself with things that bring me joy. I seek to find the joy in the things that surround me. That impacted some members of the tribe so much that one of them actually turned it into a meme, which I thought was super awesome. Because I remember when I said it, being like, holy shit, I don't know if I've ever actually said those words in that order out loud, but that is exactly what I strive to do. Finding joy in what's around me. So I'm constantly trying to find things to surround myself with that bring me joy. There will be times where I won't even realize that something that could have brought me joy would have brought me joy had I just invited it into my inner circle. There's a lot of times where things that we thought were bad or weren't going to be beneficial or weren't going to provide us any level of growth, once they were introduced into our lives and we began to acclimate to this new thing, all of a sudden it was like, holy shit, I'm so glad I learned that. Or I'm so glad I did that. I'm so glad I experienced that. But at first, during the time, that wasn't what we were thinking. That wasn't what we were thinking at all. When I broke my leg on August 13th of 2016 and was told by the doctors that I was going to be laid up in bed for the next three to four months and that my leg was pretty much damaged beyond repair, you know, but not, not enough to do surgery on it, but just enough to make sure that you don't get to walk on it for four months, I, I thought it was the worst thing that had ever happened to me in my entire life. I remember saying that to myself. This is the worst thing that has ever happened to me. Maybe I'll put it as second place to mom dying. But overall, I remember thinking, like, just me, what's happening to me, nobody else being involved, no parents dying, no first girlfriend or best friend from college dying, like, none of, no favorite pet dying, just for simply Jesse's world, I thought it was the worst thing that had ever happened to me. And I treated it as such. I drank myself into utter obliter fucking ration, right? Damn near killed myself with alcohol and drugs. Woke up in a shit tub more times than I would ever care to share, except on here, and I talk about it all the time. But ultimately, when I walked into Kaiser, you know, on January 13th of 2017, it was like, that's it. That's it. I'm, call- I'm calling in the National Guard. I'm calling in, I'm calling in some help here. I need, I need someone to give me better direction. I'm going to die. That ended up being the best day of my life when I finally made the decision to no longer drink or use drugs. And to me, it was started because I broke my leg. The ability to manage my drinking and to continue being a functioning alcoholic, it was put to the test. I I couldn't do it. But I needed that leg breaking to be laid up in my house for four months, to have no one expecting anything of me, to have nobody calling me. 
people called me, I just kept throwing my phone in a drawer. wouldn't answer it for like a week. I, I was, I was just blacked out drunk. Like I didn't want anybody knowing what I was up to. But what I thought was the worst day turned out to be the best day. Breaking my leg was the best thing that could have ever happened to me. It was the beginning of this journey, and now we're here today talking about this stuff because of that broken leg. Would I have gotten sober some other way? Perhaps. Perhaps not. Maybe I would have just kept thinking that I could keep floundering, and I would never have gotten sober and then been talking with excitement one day to a friend who was like, hey, you know what? You should learn some NLP because you're talking like someone who's really ready for it. And then I wouldn't have flown to Florida and been introduced to it and then found the evolution team and then turned this into this whole thing. Like, who knows? It all fell into place at just the right time. And I say this because for some of you, I hear you come back with me in messages or even in the tribe. It's like, man, I really wish I'd have known this a long time ago. I wish I'd have done something about this, yeah, blah, blah, blah. But it's like you did it when you did it when, because that's when it was time to do it. Saying, I should have done it then, I should have done it. That's, that's conflict language. Shoulda, woulda, coulda, right? That's, that, that creates a conflict within yourself. I will. I am doing i can that that's that's architect language that's building yourself up not tearing yourself down for what you would have should have could have done you are in control of your mind therefore you are in control of your results you get to decide what you're going to think about each and every day you are the person who decides do i want to keep spiraling on this one thought or do i want to pattern interrupt myself out of it and think about something else I am someone who will very frequently spiral around really shitty thoughts. It's almost like I, I, I start playing a movie in my head about it. And it's like my brain just is like, nope, I want to focus on this now. And I'm like, and I'm like, stop. I'm like, what else could you be doing with the next 20 minutes of your life rather than spiraling around this crappy thought right now? Go get some steps. Pop in a a cool song. Go listen to a podcast. Sit down and actually write something. Create something. I mean, I've got plenty of things I could be doing with my time other than spiraling around on some negative thought that isn't actually going to help me. If it's about someone else, then it's time to go have a conversation with that person and not just sit there, you know, getting all pissy and moany in my head because that's not going to move anything forward. Right? Speaking your truth is the best way for someone else to begin to understand what you are going through. If you're taking notes during this episode, thank you because I'm all over the place. But two, write this down. Speaking your truth is the best way for someone else to begin to understand what you're going through. They won't completely understand. They may not even get on board with what you're saying. But you speak your truth, and it at least allows them to understand your point of view. It may not be their point of view. That's okay. Everyone gets to have their own point of view. When we're in relationships with people, when we're bonding with people, it's that ability to say, okay, you can have yours, I can have mine. And it's not an agree to disagree thing. It's an agree that we all have a different subjective perspective kind of thing. I hate it. Let's just agree to disagree. It's like we got to walk around feeling like we're disagreeing. We're not disagreeing. I have my perspective, you have your perspective. Agreeing to disagree still puts a label on somebody is wrong here. We're just not going to continue fighting over which one of us is more wrong. (laughs) I don't want that energy. I don't want that energy. I I mean, is an Oreo as healthy for me as broccoli? I already know going into it that an Oreo is delicious because it's not real food, and broccoli is not as delicious because it is real food. Somebody else could be like, are you crazy? Broccoli is the most delicious thing ever. Hey, I get it. I eat tons of that shit too. But you are not going to tell me that broccoli is better tasting than an Oreo. It doesn't, no, no, no. Even someone who's a vegetarian who's sworn away Oreos can still not possibly convince me that an Oreo doesn't taste better than broccoli. I'm not saying which one's healthier. That's a given too. We already know broccoli's healthier than an Oreo. But to sit here and try to convince me that an Oreo is better tasting than broccoli is is ridiculous. I will not do that. I'm not going to sit here and scream at somebody else if they're going to try to convince me why broccoli is awesome. I also think broccoli is awesome. And I will eat broccoli so I can justify the Oreo later. (laughs) And this is the beauty of understanding that we all have our own perspective on things. Someone out there, one of y'all right now could be like, Oreos? Seriously? Uh, Chocolate chip cookies. Or snickerdoodles. Or, I don't know, Little Debbie zebra cakes. You can have whatever you like. 
it's not agreeing to disagree on which one's tastier. It's just realizing that we all have our own subjective perspective. When I get into these training seminars and I get everybody on my Zoom or I get them in person and we start to go through this stuff, one of the coolest things about it is being able to experience somebody else healing their trauma. Because one of the things that we do during these training sessions is that, yeah, every single thing we teach, then there's a demonstration on how you do it with yourself or a client. And then you go off and you do it, we partner you up. So you have this opportunity to actually experience this process, this new way of thinking, this new way of experiencing. You get into it. So we're going to teach about 40 new things over the course of these 100 hours that this training is going to take. And each one of the things we teach, the, they get to put themselves through it with another member of the class. And it's so powerful because by the end of it, it's like, wow, you've worked on like 40 different things. Right? We had somebody go over like jealousy they feel whenever, you know, um, a, another woman pays their boyfriend attention. Right. And what, how interesting that is to experience that from her point of view, his point of view, and the other person's point of view, the fly on the wall. What are the things that are occurring that no one's even aware of? What's being said that's not being said? Like walking them through all of this. And then it's like you get like bam, bam, bam. And at some point people are like, I think I've I've healed so much I'm not even sure what I could heal anymore. I'm like, let's just give it a couple hours. <laughs> it's something's gonna elicit an internal charge and you'll be like, Okay, okay, I just felt it right there. You said broccoli was del- it was disgusting compared to Oreos and I immediately got internally angry angry about that. Let's explore it. It's one of my favorite things to say, well, would you like to explore that? How about, would you like to process that? Maybe we can unpack that a little bit, right? It's that kind of conscious communication where we realize that people are presenting their model of the world, their point of view to us all the time. If we're willing to listen, to learn more about them and grow with them rather than to simply just disagree, right? To simply prove who's right or who's wrong, Right, like I've got some contrarians in my life. It's like no matter what I say, it's like I feel like they've just got a contradiction to it. And at some point, I'm like, oh my goodness, are we seriously? Like, can I not just say a sentence without you immediately being like, well, I'm like, I'm just, I'm just making a statement about what it is I'm experiencing. When we listen to learn about the other person's point of view, the other person's model of the world they've created inside them, we get this amazing opportunity to really have conversations that allow each person to be heard. And when you speak your truth, you give that person an opportunity to understand more about what's going on. When I do these trainings and I have this opportunity for people to really step into their own voice, it's amazing to watch them heal themselves and then say, wow, I can see so many different ways to bring this to my clients or to bring this to my staff, to my coworkers. Like I can't wait for them to experience what I just experienced. And that kind of elation on their faces, the, the, the look in their eye, that little glimmer when they realize that something that they've been holding on to with the death grip for so long just finally was unloosened long enough to just figure out a different way to experience it. We don't delete our past. It's always in our soup. Our past is is what our soup is made of. What are you choosing today to add to your soup? What are some different ways you can begin to experience life? How are you ready to begin your fullest growth and your fullest development? You know, uh, one of the members of the tribe posts these super really cool things like memes in, in there. And one of them was uh, the butterfly is only beautiful because the, the cal- because the caterpillar is brave. The caterpillar is just the caterpillar. Right? The, the, maybe the, and another one she posted was maybe this has been a cocoon all along. Everything that was happening to you, I got chills in my arms, so this is a great way to end the show. And I pulled like 10 of these things aside and then just got on here and rambled. And and this is all I could, this is all my brain could muster today, y'all. I was just talking through everything I experienced last week, but in this sort of meta way. Um, But what if all along it was a cocoon, right? The events from your childhood that that were that were what you now latched onto as traumas and suffering, and then the the using and the drinking and the drugs, and um, no doubt we were all a little bit promiscuous, or we were all a little bit less in you know our morals, ethics, and values. And there's no doubt that we took advantage of some people, and we spread lies, and maybe even some gossip, <laughs> maybe gossip. I mean, let's face it, you know the uh, the the addicted self is existing its primary focus is on its own self-preservation. 
So what if all along, right, it was just, we were just in the cocoon. And we were brave back then as the caterpillar, going through all of the traumas and the traumatic moments and the sufferings and the using and the abusing and just the, the utter hatred we had for ourselves. What if all along that was just us as a caterpillar into the cocoon? And now we get to emerge as this amazing butterfly that gets to spread the wings and just enjoy the beauty that is the world, knowing that, yeah, there's storms. The wind will blow us around. I, there, there will be predators. There, there will be challengers to who we are as this butterfly. But it doesn't make us less of a butterfly to be you know, bobbing and weaving past the predators. It doesn't make us less than a butterfly to have the wind blow us off course. Butterfly doesn't get pissed that the wind blew it off course. It just adjusts and gets itself back on course. One of the, one, another one of the memes is that first it's an intention, then it's a behavior then it's a habit, then it's a practice, then it's second nature, and then it's just simply who you are. And we'll end on that one because I think this is a really great um, exploration of the um, habit loop of cue, craving, response, reward, right? Like we, we have all of these habits that exist in us and many of them are no longer serving our highest sense of self. So we set this intention. I want to become a better communicator. All right, then we behave. Well, how would a better communicator behave? They would speak their truth. They would listen to somebody else's truth. They would have an open, honest communication back and forth about each other's truths. The more you do this, the more just having open, honest communication with the other person becomes a habit. All right? Then it becomes this thing that we're you know, consistently practicing. It's a, in human design, which is something that I've become learning more about, they call it the experiment, that our life is this amazing experiment. So we take this intention, turn it into a behavior, create a habit out of it, and then it becomes this experiment. It becomes this practice, something that we're doing day in and day out, right? Until it's just second nature. Like we don't even we don't even notice that our unconscious mind is completely taken it over and just made it who we are. There are so many opportunities in life for the 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 winds of change to come in. It might blow us off our course, but perhaps that getting blown off course was the best thing that could happen to us. Perhaps where we were going wasn't where we should have been heading. Who knows? But that's the beautiful thing about life and about this experience that we're all sharing. As these human beings who have good days and bad days, we ebb and flow. Life is 50-50. It's up, it's down, it's left, it's right. It's all of the above and none of the above. What would it be like to experience life from a place of perpetual growth and experience rather than internal hatred and a desire to change just because you think you were bad. What is bad? Who is bad? If bad is just simply subjective perspective, then so is good. So is evil. Right, wrong, up, down. They can simultaneously exist and not exist all at once. We are not our labels. We are not our labels. We are not who we used to be. We are who we choose to be today. And allow today to be the day for you to choose the version of yourself that will fuel you to continue taking steps forward. Who you decide you are when you look back at the mirror is the person you should most want to impress, the person you should most want to make happy. Other people's external validation and determinations of whether you're moving forward or not, that has so little to do with you and so much more to do with their own internal subjective perspective of themselves. What would it be like to release the judgment you feel from others? What would it be like to realize that there is no judging at all? If there's any judging that even might remotely exist, it's the judgment of themselves compared to you. And that's the them thing. That is not a you thing. Sure. I would love to go back in time, in some ways, and not snort and and drink my entire 20s and 30s away. But everything that happened, happened when it happened, exactly for the reasons that it's happening now. And when is the best time ever when to choose to change the way you see yourself? So that who is looking back is exactly the person you know you're supposed to be today, knowing full well that there's another version right around the corner. And then you can look at that person and say, did I make the best steps forward? 
All right, we want to grow. We want to evolve. We want to learn. We want to apply. We want to evaluate. All of these things matter. Our life is so much more infinite than we can even begin to possibly realize. Putting yourself in a box on who you were yesterday or who you were a year ago or who you were 10 years ago, that's not something that you actually want to do. Society may have programmed that into you. Society might be trying to do that for you, but that is not something you would actually want to do for yourself. We know what it's like when a healthy adult is talking to a child and the child is expressing all of their hopes, dreams, and visions, and all they sit there and do is encourage. We know we've seen it. Hell, we've probably done it. And at times, someone did it for you as well when you were young. Maybe not who you wanted to be doing it for you, but someone looked you in the eyes and said, you know what? There is something inside of you that is brighter and more amazing than anyone around you is supporting. Perhaps you didn't hear it enough then, but you can hear it today and you can hear it right now. That you are more than you ever thought you were. You are more than you can even imagine yourself being right now today. Everything that you desire is on the other side of risking whatever comfort zone you are no longer even comfortable in. Don't say I can't when I can is so much easier. The doing is going to take effort, but either way, time is going to continue to move forward. Do you want to guilt yourself? Has you mental gymnastics your way into making an excuse for why you didn't take this huge leap and make an amazing change? Or you simply just want to start moving forward toward the change? And before you know it, the change is just your behavior. And then the changing is a habit. And then you're experiencing your practice in a whole new way. We all got to this point because of what we believed we were experiencing. It's never too late to have an amazing childhood. It's never too late to re-experience things that we used to think were one way and can now completely be different. Simply by taking one step, left, right, up, down, one degree, 10 degrees, whatever it might be. Who you think you are is not based on who you used to be. It's on who you choose to be right now. And right now, I choose to be this never-ending, limitless possibility version of Jesse. I invite you to join me. All right, my friends, that's it. I had an amazing week, and I hope that you did too. But regardless of what last week was, right now, in this moment, and moving forward, is our opportunity to do exactly what we think we could be doing inside ourselves and for others around us to just create this amazing world, right? I'll say one cliche thing, and I'll get you out of here on this. Be the change you want to see in the world and start with yourself. Inclusivity over exclusivity, the power of positive energy, release and flow. Every day is the best day of my life, your life. Anyone who steps into this world with us, anyone who's sober curious, invite them to listen to this show, to be a part of this, because we know every day is our best day when we wake up sober. Shout out to Sunshine. Glow on. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.